Hello, innovators. I'm Dustin Miller, Poly Innovator. Today I'm talking with Eric Thor, a content creator, specialist in young game psychology, front end developer, WordPress guru, personality expert, and personal growth coach. Thank you for joining me on the Polymath Polycast. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, after our conversation last time, I was uh, really looking forward to this conversation with you again. So I'm really glad to be here. Yeah, well, and I came on your show. We also just talked in general on a random phone call, and now I have you on my show. So it's like, this is the third time. I think we're just kind of steamrolling through a lot of this, I feel like. Yeah, this is going to be a lot, I think. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the Polymath Polycast. So the way I like to break the ice, and like obviously I don't have to really break the ice with you, but for the audience, I feel like this is a good way to do it. I like to ask you to share something about yourself that no one knows about you. Huh. So I prepared for that question oh. <laughs> because I knew you were going to ask it <laughs> since I watched your other podcasts. Uh, so I actually good have trauma. a planned answer. Um, and uh, basically, um, I'd say something that nobody knows, um, and this is quite new is that I just became a digital nomad. So mm. I just got my place in, I will start out in Spain. So I'll be going to Spain in August. And uh, my goal is to try to travel across the world and slow travel, basically get to experience different cultures and different places for longer periods of time to really learn the language, to meet new people, to get new experiences and perspectives. So I'm super excited about that. So this is yeah, uh, completely new. I just awesome. uh, got it. Uh, today I said, I just paid for everything and got it ready. So that's so, Where in Spain? Uh, uh, so I'll be starting in Barcelona, hopefully travel around a bit, see different parts of the country and maybe Southern France and, uh, <laughs> Portugal. So, well, and I really want to see Catalonia as well. Barcelona in, uh, city in particular is one of the few smart cities of the world. That's pretty prominent. And I really want to go there at some point. So when you say smart city, what do you mean with that? Yeah. So smart cities is a concept of just like a futuristic city where they have a lot of connected devices and working on a more, I guess you could say futuristic city. That's why I like Singapore mm. so much. That's why I like Barcelona. Cause even like mm. New York isn't necessarily getting too smart, but when you have different uh, connected devices, so like even the streetlights ahead of you are connected, the roads themselves might have some kind of re readers to tell how much traffic is going over them, that kind of thing. And so, oh. yeah. That is so cool. I do get the vibe that Barcelona is super international, that there's lots of co-working spaces. There were so many communities. I was there for a week, so I really get the chance to experience it. So I really mm -hmm. do hope that I will learn a lot from it. Uh, just philosophy, for example, there's a huge organization of uh, different philosophy communities around there with hundreds and hundreds of people that meet every week. So like, there's a really good chance to have some really interesting conversations there. For sure. And I think learning Spanish too in person there would be really fun. For sure. And practicing that in person. Yeah. Yeah. Looking forward to that. So first question here, what was your mindset five years ago and how have you changed since then? Oh, that one is a, was a very tough one for me. So, okay. What I would say is, uh, five years ago, I was still quite sure that, you know, there was one truth, one correct answer that I had to find you know, one, uh, uh, identity, one personality, one way of living that I thought would be the ultimate way of living. Right. So I had this idea that, uh, if I could find out who I was and what my true personality was and, you know, my ideal way of life, and if I could learn to incorporate that into every part of my day and into every action and every activity and everything mm. that I did, I'd somehow find this magical moment of flow or sand, yeah. right? Where, you know, everything would be super easy and uh, everything would work out. Right. But what I came to realize in the later years was that uh, searching for fixed truths or like one correct answer tends to lead to a fixed mindset which tends to lead to stagnation, which tends to lead to arrogance and which directly becomes counterproductive because it keeps you from learning and growing and changing from each experience that you have. And so I've had to adopt a more pluralistic idea of truth, uh, where to me nowadays, truth is a tool, kind of a stepping stone to the next truth and to the truth after that and so on. So nowadays I approach personality psychology and, uh, 
the study of individuation and in the identity a lot more open-ended than what I used mm -hmm. to. So in the past, I used to provide people with typing services where they could come to me, find out their personality type and, you know, uh, but these days I provide, you know, these self-exploration sessions where people get the chance to learn new things about themselves and think about who they are and things they would like to change and things they would like to be different. And, uh, yeah, basically we just explore and think together about what identity is and how to, you know, connect more with your highest version of yourself or to, you know, live a more fulfilling life. And reaching that highest version too, I, I, I don't know if this really relates or not, but I remember back when I was first really started out on my self-development journey, like what you said that really resonated with me because I remember thinking to myself, you know, okay, I want to practice more languages. So Duolingo is one of the things I really wanted to get done. I wanted to exercise every day. I wanted to meditate every day. I wanted to read every day. I wanted to create content every day. I wanted to start these habits because the person yeah. I envisioned myself to be was the person that would do all these habits every day. Mm. And even at this point, I still don't do that. But no. I know that I have the systems way more refined than I did back then. And I was trying to think about what would that ideal version of me look like? And then how do I do it? And so it's just yeah. a fascinating concept. Yeah. So I was recently listening to an interview with Michio Kaku about mm -hmm. uh, quantum physics of all topics. And uh, he was talking about how, you know, how we measure consciousness, right? And he talked about how we can measure it in units. And we can say that, you know, if we look at basic life forms, we can see a couple scripts, maybe just like uh, eat, reproduce, you know, like these very basic things that you do, right? But uh, the more advanced and complex the life form and the more we develop, the more scripts we end up getting. So, right, <laughs> I, co ice cold showers, you know, going to the gym, you know, uh, creating content, you know, going out into nature, reading, you know, all these different scripts, you know, uh, they, they together become this web that, you know, makes you a well-rounded person with high cognitive flexibility and these things mm -hmm. add to one another, right? So a lot of the time it's, of course, you can't do everything at the same time, but, but by switch. doing these different things, it's uh, possible to broaden yourself out, do, do everything more. Mm -hmm. Apologies, I didn't mean to interrupt there. But I think this, the idea of scripts is a very interesting way. It almost comes from like a coding perspective. Like you have these underlying scripts that are just hard coded into you for, for the most part, or you, card, yeah. you code them yourself into your, in your routine, you create those exactly. systems. And I think having a second brain helps with that as well. Cause then it helps alleviate some of the memory portion of having those scripts. You don't have to think about them as much because they're just, they're You can just dump them into your system. The system will remind you to keep that script up. Yeah, exactly. And that's something I'm super interested in. And I know you're working on that. And how do you feel like you're currently coming along with that? Uh, has there been any progress in the past week or like any new things that you've noticed? Any benefits? Uh, I am still working on categorizing and adding tags to everything. I have gone through all the plugins of Obsidian, for example, and I realized that there are stuff that I thought would work like calendar plugins or project management plugins that don't work. And so what I needed to do was find a plugin, like a reminders tool or something like that and repurpose it for the needs that I needed to do. I think mm -hmm. having that more MacGyver mindset is really key to a lot of these tools that you can use. Right. Yeah. Actually uh, today in the past few days, I realized that, uh, it might not actually be necessary to uh, because in the past, I always thought, you know, to compete with AI and with the, all the increases in complexity in the world today, uh, we might need to eventually merge with machines and like <laughs> find the ability to integrate more of our consciousness with uh, technology. But now I'm starting to see that maybe it's also even possible to do so through organic means, right? So perhaps even through biology, through personal growth and personal development, it's possible to achieve, you know, these, uh, you know, optimal states. I mean, there's people out there mm. that have photographic memories, right? That, you know, they memorize everything they see just like that. Right. So clearly there seems to be like a lot of power inside us that we could access and learn to access better if we understand ourselves more. So I'm starting to wonder, you know, to which extent do we need to, you know, use technology and tools to broaden our consciousness and to which extent is it possible to just do it through organic means? Well, and I think this goes back to the scripts from what we talked about before. In fact, this was kind of an idea you spawned on me, but just didn't come up when we were talking earlier in the conversation. 
I love this idea of every day you have different energies, right? You have different amount of energy. When I was a mm. coach, physical coach, I would have clients come in. Some days they were not feeling the great. Some days they were feeling extra great. It's just a matter of the day uh, as it happened, right? Yeah. And so as a coach, I had to be like, okay, I had to read their body language, understand how they were feeling, ask them obviously too, and change what I was doing based on their energy levels. Because what I do as a coach yeah. is based on them. But that mm. same rule applies to ourselves too. When you wake up in the morning, how are you feeling? Are you feeling a yeah. little bit more sluggish? Was it harder to get out of the day? Well, then your day is going to be kind of based on that as well. Exactly, exactly. And I've found that often, you know, if we want to experience flow, we kind of have to learn to just go with our own energy and work around ourselves, right? Because <laughs> uh, while you can definitely discipline yourself and like push yourself a lot of the time, there tends to be a cost to doing that over time, right? So what I find nowadays is if, for example, if I don't have the energy or inspiration to write, I tend to read. And if I don't have the energy to work or focus on my computer as a programmer, I go out into nature and I yeah, try to do walk. the opposite of whatever it is, because it's, I realized that, you know, it's never the case that we don't have any energy. It's the case that we don't have the energy to do certain things, right? So we actually <laughs> have multiple different battery packs inside us that we can pull from. And it's very rare for all those batteries to be completely drained. Usually there's still something we'd really enjoy and respond really well mm -hmm. to. I like that kind of like going into the concept of interleaving where if you're not doing one thing, you can do a different thing. Mm. I, I do think that there are days where, yeah, you are drained because I think it was, uh, what's his face? Tim Ferriss. He came up with this idea of attention units. You only have so much attention, attention units per day. I also have friends who are quote unquote spoonies as, as they're called because they own it comes from the spoon concept where they only have so much spoons per day. And as people who have health issues like in their life, right, they have ailments that prevent them from doing what most typical people would be able to do. Their energy levels are naturally lower than what the typical population would have. They're known as spoonies because they only have so much spoons per day and on average they have less spoons. And so they have to decide what opportunity costs, like what spoons can I spend on today? Because I don't have as much as what my, most people might have. They might start mm. out the day with 70% versus a hundred percent. And even right. for perhaps more typical people like ourselves, we only have so many attention units, right? We have to choose what we can spend that on. And I think it's interesting to think that like, okay, if I cannot spend my attention units on learning today, I just don't have the capacity to take in information. Well, then I can spend yeah. it on creating instead or going out of mm. nature, something like that. Yeah. I mean, for example, when you take the Spoonies example, I often think of introverts when I think of that. Like I think uh, introverts in general tend to have less enthusiasm when they speak. They tend to have less energy and less attention in the sense. But often what I find is that uh, we also have to look at not just how much attention units can we give, but how intense are those int attention units as well, right? Because I often find that a lot of people, especially like introverts, tend to have a lot, like they tend to be hyper attentive when they are going out, right? They tend to be very like overthinking everything, you know, what if that happens? What if this goes on? Like uh, in a sense, which really drains your batteries really quickly. So if you go into a situation with a lot of anxiety and a lot of like this tendency to think that I have to be really socially popular, I have to work really hard and push myself, you know, to do something. Often what tends to happen is we drain our batteries very quickly. So often it also seems to be that, you know, it's not just about, you know, conserving how many things I do, but also learning to lower your volume, right? So mm -hmm. realizing that, you know, you can go to an event, but you don't actually have to be loud and social and charming. You can also just observe and listen and just go with the flow as you feel like. So, and if you do that, it's also a lot easier to manage your attention and keep it up easier because if you start forcing it, pushing the attention onto things and pressuring yourself, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to disappear very quickly. It accelerates the burn. It's interesting too, because when it comes to building habits, right? Or systems more importantly than habits, it's a matter of just doing it, not necessarily doing it to the fullest capacity. So I think it was an atomic habits where I heard this, but basically if you want to make a habit of going to the gym, you don't necessarily have to go to the gym and go work out for the first like five to eight times. You could just go there, look around and then just leave. What ha what yeah. matters is the habit of just getting there. Right. Right. And that spends a lot less energy than going there and trying to work out than if you don't have that capacity. Something about that just sounds so incredibly funny to me. Like just going in <laughs> and being like, oh, okay. 
Nice, nice. place. <laughs> Dip out. They, I mean, they do offer coffee there, so you could also just grab a coffee and Depends you know make it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So just uh, chill out in the lounge and you know look at everyone else sweating. <laughs> well, and they also say to like the next few times after that, maybe pick up a weight, try out a machine, and just kind of edge your way into it. Exactly. But, I mean, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Atomic Habits and uh, Tool <laughs> Theory and simplifying your goals, making things smaller, becoming more minimalistic in how you approach things. Because what I see is the number one act of self-sabotage is make projects so big and so difficult that it simply won't uh, hold on together for a longer period of time. So a lot mm -hmm. of the time when I like I have friends that are pushing themselves, you know, like I have to clean my house, I have to go to the gym, I have to go, uh, you know, take care of these shores. And I'm like, you know, sometimes trying to be too efficient it's not very efficient. It's like not, it, it ends up becoming counterproductive. You're sabotaging yourself. You try too hard. Don't try too hard. Yeah, exactly, uh, exactly. Leading into the next question here, uh, I just want to share a little anecdote, I guess. People ask me a lot, how do I create so much content? And I find that what we talked about, the whole interleaving concept, switching between things, that helps a lot. And really relying on the systems in place, too. So I have a lot of series. I know you have a lot of series. What led you to create the Eric Thor channel and really just all your channels in general, too? Yeah, so... I can say that I've always had a big passion for communicating and connecting with other people and sharing my thoughts. And for me, a lot of the time, if I, I think a lot and I spend a long time, you know, uh, much by myself, just re researching things, thinking about philosophy, different questions of life. But I got to a point where I was like, you know, I have to get from the theory and I have to get into the practice. And I started realizing by putting my content out there, I got a chance to hear my own thoughts be vocalized. And by doing so, I could encourage myself to have a continuous process of exploration and learning. So I started making, you know, these basic uh, videos on Eric Thor, just basic blogs about personality types and psychology. And uh, that was like, 2007. Well, actually, I started with politics and then I moved to psychology. So that was quite yes. a long time. Um, and um, I just realized it was so much fun. And I started getting an audience that, uh, and it was so cool to, you know, get that conversation going with people and to hear everyone's thoughts and responses and uh, learning from other people as well, because it brought me to connect with so many cool and interesting people. And uh, it got me out into the world in a way like, uh, that was just amazing to me. So mm. uh, I just fell into it and I just never got out of it. I just absolutely load every moment of it. I love that. And I think you and I both have a similar philosophy when it comes to content. And I love how we just kind of fell into it. You might have done more videos. I did more blogging. But either way, I, I resonate with you based on that. I am surprised that I did not notice that it was all the way back in 2007. That's that's crazy. That's really early on. I can say that I think most of the videos from Dan are unlisted or removed. Oh. And I'd love to find them if I had, but I think I, you know, in the beginning phase of putting my content out there, I was a lot more anxious and uh, <laughs> it was a lot more scary to put out your thoughts. And of course I was like 20 uh, years old. So I was also saying a lot of things that I would today consider to be kind of miseducated and silly and uh, stupid. So I also became very critical of what I did. So there were a couple of times where I, you know, I started making videos and I didn't like them, then I removed them, took down my channel, started over, you know, so mm. it was a long process before I committed to it. I think it was in 2016 where I really started like going for it and uh, just realizing certain things that made it a lot easier for me to create content without anxiety. Yeah. For me, it was 2017 too. So I get it. Like, I feel like around that time was just a really great time to be on the internet. That was like a few yeah. years there. Yeah, it was uh, my, like, from the get go, my channel just exploded. Like, uh, it was uh, such, so much easier in a way because there was a lot less competition too. Uh, so nowadays, like, there's so much content online. And now, like, I've always had the philosophy that if it's you, it's good, right? If it's, if you're able to be yourself and express yourself, yeah. it's all good content. So I think uh, nobody should be afraid of, you know, expressing themselves and, should recognize, you know, what you did, whatever it is you put out into the world is a part of your process and how you grow as a person, right? 
But I also find that, you know, these days we have to think about, you know, what is good content and what is it that is worth of people's attention because there's so much content. And so like, we have to think about what is it that is worth people's attention and time. Yeah, definitely want to make it worthwhile. You keep saying there's so much content, there's so much content. And it's funny because in my perspective, I still feel like we're barely getting started as like a species on the internet because yeah, I've been, I've been around for a while and like I, I, I joined blogging back in around 2011, 2012, which was technically late. Like basically blogging was a big thing in the 2000s, but even nowadays blogging is still a thing. Uh, YouTube, obviously back in 2007, 2010 were the, was like the big years and we didn't really get really started, started until later 2010s. And back then there was competition. People were still, it was still building out. People thought it was too late back in 2018 to start a YouTube channel. Obviously we know that was not true because in 2020 no. and 2021, it exploded again. And same yeah. with podcasting. Podcasting exploded a few times over the years. And as someone, I'm sure you understand, who has been through those waves, seeing it get bigger and bigger and bigger, it seems like it's so populated compared to where we were at before. Same with TikTok. Mm. I've been on TikTok since 2018 to musically yeah. back then, and I've seen it explode multiple times. People are like, oh, yeah. it's finally becoming popular now. It's like, it, it's been, it was like a billion users last year. But like, uh, it's interesting to think about how once more people, maybe in other countries like inter, uh, Latin America or Africa, places where internet's still kind of growing more and more, it's going to exponentially grow how much content yeah. is going to be on the internet. So we're still yeah. early on. Yeah, that's so true. Like, uh, we are still in the infancy of the internet. So it's, I would uh, say toddler, toddler stage. Yeah. Okay. Toddler stage. I can go with that <laughs> because, uh, we are starting to, you know, get the grasp of what you're supposed to do, but we still like, kind of have no clue. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I, I agree with you now, like, uh, we're going to get a lot more content and so we're going to need smarter algorithms. We're going to need to change how we find and search content online and uh, what is recommended to us. And I think, you know, we move through fads a lot, so we got TikTok, but now it seems like a lot of people are also moving away from TikTok back to YouTube. So it's kind of like, go, it always goes, yeah, exactly. It goes really up and down. Well, and I don't know if you've been keeping up with what's happening with Twitch right now, but Twitch is just digging themselves a grave every turn they do. Uh, they they made a recent change that might help a little bit where they're giving like a 70-30 split, but even that, I don't think it's going to help all the issues they have. No, and it's a problem for them because they are still struggling to monetize and stay profitable because they're not a profitable company. I mean, like very few, actually very few internet companies are profitable. Like most of the profit of most companies are driven by their growth. So they just reinvest and, you know, they just keep going. But yeah, for Twitch, it's been like a big problem because Amazon really wants this to become like a product that can make them money. And um, at the same time, you know, if people don't get their own uh, a fair split, they're going to go somewhere else. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> well, there's no discoverability on there. Something that Harris Heller said that was very interesting is that they have clips on Twitch, Twitch has a whole clips feature that's pretty well used, but they have no discoverability for it. Had they just like done something along the lines of, Hey, here's a scrolling feed you can do like on TikTok or shorts. That way there's actually discoverability on the platform. People could, if they're waiting for someone to go live, something like that, they can go on their little shorts feed and Twitch shorts, I guess you could say, or Twitch clips. They're scrolling through, they find new people they like that way. Then they could also do paid ads like these other platforms are doing and generating income from. That is a huge idea that I don't think they're ever going to probably do, but that would be perfect. Yeah. I think, you know, with shorts and short form content, I, it is not all like I'm finding that most people that work with it don't really like it. And, you know, after a certain point of time, most people that do short form content eventually start podcasts or long form content mm -hmm. because they realize that there's not a lot of money in it. You know, when you start getting your paychecks from TikTok or YouTube, it's, you know, it's a fraction of a dollar per like uh, uh, view. So what you get for that kind of content seems to make it very unattractive and advertisers don't like it and don't really want to advertise on short form content either. So it's very hard to monetize it. So I'm thinking that uh, it's going to be about discoverability like it's going to be yeah. something people use to drive and, and attract an audience but then people are going to try to go and like take it over so like probably what twitch does with their clip features for videos is actually a really good thing because if you integrate long form and short form content then you can make shorts that directly link to and like 
a specific video that you made and use it for like content repurposing and things like that. I think that mm -hmm. could also be something that's really positive because then people get the chance to, you know, come in and, you know, watch a quick one minute that of your best quote of something you said in a video, but uh, yeah. then if they really like it, they can always go and watch the full thing. Short and long form go hand in hand. And I've always believed in that, but a lot of people just don't get it. They seem like it, it's like they don't want to try to do it. I've never tried to monetize my short form content. And I don't really feel like I should for the most part. Sure, I can go get the few cents on a dollar, but I care more about having doors to my main stuff that I do. Each little yeah. short piece of content is a new door that people can come into. And I yeah. I use tools like Opus or Doom or even Recast to chop up these interviews and make them into clips. Now I have yeah. hundreds of clips I can share and that's hundreds of doors. Yeah, and for your I tried Opus too. and it's amazing and it's been like i've been able to create a lot of really good like shorts and tiktoks awesome. and everything around it so thank you so much for recommending that like you're really good I, at finding I, all these tools <laughs> i need to make a clip of that so i can use that as like <laughs> the uh yeah tool finder thing so what is the importance of understanding personalities yeah so to me it's uh, a lot of people actually don't know a lot about themselves and i notice that when i ask people questions about themselves and how they see themselves and how they look at themselves and i notice <laughs> that people have some conception of who they are but it's very rudimentary most people tend to you know just say well i'm a guy like or i'm a girl you know like that becomes like mm -hmm. your personality and how you look at yourself and maybe it can be a reflection of some aspects of your personality right but uh, very few people actually spend a lot of time thinking about what it is that they want and what it is that they enjoy and i get it because it's kind of difficult questions but if you don't know who you are what you want it's very hard to make conscious choices about your job or about your relationships or about your life or about where you want to go in life and so it's uh, easy to just follow and mimic other people. So it's very easy that most people will just study others and be like, well, they are doing that and that seems to work for them. So I'm going to try to do that for myself. And, you know, <laughs> what I'm finding is, you know, if people are able to listen more to themselves and tune into themselves, now this is a personal story, but like, uh, I used to be in politics and I was uh, working really hard in that. And I was very passionate about climate change. Well, not having climate change, but preventing it and working around mm -hmm. it. And uh, I did it to the point where it became my dominant part of my life. And I just went crazy about it to the point where I basically had a burnout and, you know, mm -hmm. just pushed past all my personal limits. Like I didn't care about my energy and recharging and my batteries. And I was, uh, you know, I went into too many conflicts with other parties and other organizations, which were very taxing for me. And I uh, put myself in a lot of very stressful environments and situations, you know, to some extent, you know, it's good to push yourself and to try new things, but it's what, it was at that point that I started realizing that I have my own like, uh, current level and situation of how I feel and of what I need in order to be happy. And, uh, I need to start listening to myself more. And to me, you know, uh, personality psychology is like a tool to do that. So I don't really advise, you know, going in just to try to find out your personality type and then, you know, be done with it. I tend to say, you know, explore all of the personality types and all the different ways of thinking and think about how you express that in your own life, you know, see it as like a tool that you can use to, you mm -hmm. know, think about, you know, what are some uh, patterns that I tend to fall into? Uh, what roles do I tend to play in different relations and groups and organizations? You know, why do I make those choices and how do I like them? And what do I like about them? Do I find, what things find, do I find stressful and why, and what can I do about that? You know, like these kind of conversations mm -hmm. are super important if you want to feel that you're living your own life and that you're happy and that you're taking care of yourself and that you are doing what's right for you. It's almost as if you're treating them as like mental models, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, a, it's, I recently thought of it as like a user inf interface, right? In a sense, <laughs> like, uh, because I can think of in a situation, you know, what do I want to do right now? Do I want to extrovert and go out and talk with other people? Do I want to speak, take alone time and spend time recharging and connecting more with myself right now? Or do I want to go and discuss? cover like theoretical subjects and learn something new or do i just want to go out and do something practical and just like physical like go s do some do something athletic you know sportsy or just like something fun with friends you know like <laughs> uh i kind of use it as a way to kind of think about okay what is it i want to do to right now what do i feel like at the moment and what do i enjoy and what do i want to what 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 is my present state kind of 
that's a lot of self awareness there that I think a lot of people need to train for. But this kind of reminds me of a concept of code switching. I love that concept. So, can you explain it for people? Yeah. So we talked about code switching a bit on our podcast on my channel as well, and it's. Uh, Recently, like uh, I found that code switching and cognitive flexibility is one of the most important things that uh, you can develop. And mm -hmm. A lot of uh, my colleagues in the field are starting to realize the same thing, because if you have cognitive flexibility, well, basically like a lot of the people feel stuck in a certain role, right? So uh, it feels like you're always the person that has to be responsible while everyone else is just messing about and being, you know, <laughs> and uh, it can be difficult to break these kind of scripts because uh, we often tend to identify very strongly with something, with some value or with something that is very important. Uh, but a lot of the time when we start taking something to an extreme, you know, it starts becoming something very unsustainable. So for example, mm -hmm. my passion to prevent climate change and my desire to want to make a difference in the world led me to ignore my own needs, right? So I was focusing on everyone else's needs and what I thought everyone else wanted. And I wasn't thinking about what it is that I wanted, right? So I was stuck in that script, right? But uh, over time I started realizing that, you know, if I can take care of myself, you know, that's going to be something that's going to help other people. So. Code switching to me is really just like being able to recognize the limits of your scripts and when it's time to start writing new scripts and how you can start challenging and poking and nudging yourself to do, to make slightly better choices, right? In everyday situations. It's interesting to think about different scripts and code switching those scripts as well. So the more scripts you collect or create, the more you can switch around. I love code switching in the sense of, okay, if there's someone of a different ethnicity, I could probably approach them in a way that they're more familiar, which will make them feel more comfortable around me. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's a very positive thing to do. I had someone as a cashier at one point who I could tell was Mexican. I have a background with people of a Hispanic background. And I realized that, hey, like I can greet him in Spanish and just, I don't know, make him feel more comfortable. And just, just that small little thing. He ended up looking at me with almost tears in his eyes because he felt so accepted, so, felt so just, you know, n normalized in that situation. And I felt mm. so happy I could do that for him. It was just one yeah. of those situations. I didn't think much of it, but it made a big difference to him. I also yeah. got in trouble one day, though, for something similar where <clears throat> I guess when I was a little bit inebriated, I guess I was mimicking an accent by accident and someone got mad at me. I don't think I was, but he was way more inebriated than I was. And I found out that he was very... Angry at me, maybe I'll cut that part out. I don't know. But it was just one of those things where I was like, oh, like yeah. I wasn't trying to. No, that can happen. But the <clears> truth <throat> is, you know, you don't know other people's rules until you break them, right? So a yeah. lot of the time you kind of have to break people's rules, especially in the early stage when you're getting to know somebody. And the truth is, you know, if you do offend somebody, the only thing you can do is you can say, oh, I'm sorry. How would you like to phrase it? Or how would you like to, ex how do you experience it? Or like something like that. Because if uh, you can do that, you can create the conversation about what that person wants and what they, how they think and how they approach things. And yeah, people just want to feel heard. Like that's what we feel like. Uh, and I, I, I do the same thing. Like when I meet Dutch people, I make a point to always try to speak Dutch with them, you know, uh, at mm -hmm. least in the early conversation, just, I, I speak Dutch and I understand it perfectly. Like, so that's no problem. Uh, but, uh, it's, I'm, it makes such a difference because it makes people open up and feel, you know, now they can speak English with me and now they can do it a lot more comfortably and, mm -hmm. It's much more natural. And that's also why I want to learn Spanish as well for the same reason. Oh, okay. see. All right. So what's next question here is what are some personality types that are not true? Stereotypes. Personality Person types. <laughs> but no, hold on. What are some personality <laughs> stereotypes that are not true? Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. So, um, a lot of stereotypes exist on the internet about a lot of personality types. And yeah, the first thing we have to remember is there are no personality types in a strict sense, right? Personality mm -hmm. types are a tool that we use to orient ourselves around, you know, the complex world that is the human mind. Uh, because there, we, for most psychologists and cognitive psychologists and neuroscientists, the brain is still an uncharted territory. So we still mm -hmm. really, really know how it works and how to orient it. So we use personality types to orient ourselves around it. The problem is people tend to become very attached to these types. And uh, so that's one of the dangers with it because you want to find a group that you fit in with. And so you start like 
playing along with these rules to the point where it becomes negative for your health and happiness. And so a lot of the time, you know, it can be that you think, okay, I'm an introvert, so I just don't want to deal with people ever. And not realizing that, you know, an introvert can be super social in the right circumstances with the right people if they feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, the same thing as an extrovert, you can think that, you know, oh, yeah, uh, I uh, just want to be out and have fun. But, you know, the truth is every healthy extrovert is able to take time for themselves. Like if you look at the most extroverted individuals of the world, you know, the people that are the super talkers, you know, like think Jordan Peterson, for example, like scores extremely high on extroversion. It's everywhere out talking with people all the time, right? Uh, the truth is, if you look at his personal life, like he takes a lot of time for himself. Like he spends a lot of time reading, thinking, you know, by himself. And that's important. You know, I, I talk <laughs> about it as the kind of pendulum effect, like, we have to swing back and forth between the two uh, for mm -hmm. it to be healthy and sustainable. So if you want to connect with yourself, you also have to go out and talk to people to get perspective and that will help your thinking and help you when you go into yourself to learn more about yourself. And if you want to, you know, uh, go out more while well, you have to protect your boundaries and be mindful of your energy as an introvert and think about how you can conserve and use it right. And for what purposes and what situations to make sure that it feels comfortable for you. Yeah. And I love the whole pendulum concept there. It kind of makes me think I've noticed that ambiversions a lot more common than people realize that people yeah. are a little bit more both than rather than one side or the other. Yeah. I almost, you talk about all these personality types as like these mental models or things you could use to switch the code context, but it kind of makes me think like, what if people are omniverts where we could be all of them if we can build those all up, build up all those scripts. Exactly. That's how I think about it. Like there are people that are both highly extroverted and highly introverted at the same time. And there are people that are neater of the two, right? So hmm. there's actually people that, you know, they are neater, very socialized and struggle to get out and talk with other people, but also tend to be a bit disconnected from themselves, right? So this can especially happen if you're in an autopilot state or you're going through a difficult time in your life, you know, but Ideally, you want to be able to learn to engage in both scripts because both serve important purposes for your happiness and well-being and stability. Everyone needs people. We're ultimately very social creatures. It's interesting because I think, ironically, my roommate sounds like the person who's really kind of neither. He's more introverted from what I understand, but he also doesn't necessarily define it's just that. And I feel like I'm more of the person that is both, where... I am pretty extreme on both ends. I don't necessarily go like, I don't know. It's interesting when you explain yeah. it that way, maybe think of that. Yeah. When you think of the term of polymathy or the whole lifestyle that goes into being a Renaissance person or trying to have multiple interests and to live a fuller life in a sense, it seems to be, that's kind of the goal of uh, personality in itself, right? If you want to find flow, you kind of want to learn to connect with and broaden your personality and like, think of it as like a rubber band that you can stretch out and, you know, across different domains and different situations. So mm -hmm. you can learn to become and switch to a logical and more critical strategy in certain situations and have a lot of fun, you know, just bantering and you know arguing in a playful way and you can have like time where you can uh, engage in situations more harmoniously more emotionally and talk more deeply about feelings and where you're coming from and what your intentions are and what you how you got to where you are today right like uh, often it seems like it's almost ideal like what we have to strive mm -hmm. for like to be able to become more well-rounded and to learn to develop more capacities and more scripts I like that. And it actually leads to something here I want to ask. Something I ask all my guests is, what is a polymath to you? Yeah. So a polymath is a person that has uh, multiple expertises, right? So a person that has been able to gain a deeper awareness of multiple subjects. And uh, you can leave open how many. And uh, it uh, can be a bit of a spectrum. Like I, I really came to adopt your model of how to look at it as well. Uh, I really like that concept of, uh, you know, the omnimath being the person that knows everything and uh, uh, the expert or specialist. But what I also find like that is so interesting is, you know, there's the truth is like a person that spends all their life, you know, studying uh, mushrooms, just like getting a lot of knowledge about mushrooms can then go out and, you know, when they learn to, you know, 
uh, connect with other people, they can start seeing similarities between how mushrooms work and how relationships mm -hmm. work, and they can start using and cross applying these kind of skills. So it seems to be, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it's not just about broadening out, but it also seems that deepening your knowledge in one area seems to also lead to a broadening, like in a sense that you can you can start to cross apply these skills very easily. It almost seems like the kind of tree concept where or hourglass where as n more narrow you go, the more open it becomes because you start to see even like, once you get even more hyper-specialized, you start to see the even more connections. You get so nuanced on that subject that you have to start thinking, okay, what is the situation of fungi with trees? What's the situation of fungi and nature in general? What's the relation of fungi and humanity's biology, for example, genetically? Yeah. There's a lot of nuance and crossover once you get to a hyper-specialty. Exactly. And for me, I have no limits in what I'm interested to, right? Right now, I'm currently mm -hmm. learning a lot about quantum physics, but I'm also trying to learn about uh, biology and uh, microscopic creatures and octopi and, you know, the octopi consciousness so cool. of octopi. It, like, so in a sense, like the I have brains. this whole list. Yeah, exactly that. That's what I'm very curious about. Like uh, how, what does this teach me about consciousness and like how mm -hmm. consciousness can evolve? Some of the posts I saved in my Obsidian brain is actually about Octopi because they're just so interesting. I want to actually mention and highlight Anastasia Marchenkova, who was a guest on my show a while back. And she's one of my favorite quantum scientists that I know of. And I had her on the show and the episode itself is really interesting. I'll leave it in the description and send it to you. But it's just fascinating though the quantum realm and she focuses more on quantum computing, but she definitely has quantum science in general. Yeah. So like one question I got was like, can the human mind become a quantum computer? <laughs> right. So can we, you know, cause is it possible to, because they've been able to use organic matter to do some quantum computing methods and so on. Like, is it possible that we, because there is a field that has been starting to emerge in psychology called quantum cognition, uh, hmm. which is uh, they, they've started to realize that a lot of the principles of quantum mechanics can be applied to understand human cognition and uh, decision making processes and a lot of things like not saying that, you know, the human mind is a quantum computer. Uh, mm -hmm. They're kind of leaving that open, but they're seeing the similarities between the two fields. That's definitely going to send me down a rabbit hole later. So thank you. <laughs> it's interesting too, because one thing I'm really excited about the second brain concept is the fact that it can make synergies and idea emergence for you. And so when yeah. it comes to these deep rabbit holes, like quantum mechanics or octopi or polymathy, whatever term you're just digging into these rabbit holes, these hidden gems, trying to find those hidden gems by using a tool like obsidian or Rome research or whatever that has these connective properties, it can help you with these idea emergence. So something you might not think about, for example, the science of AI, but coming from a lens of octopi biology, like I think that'll be really fascinating to combine those two together. I don't know how you would do it, but just that kind of synergy seems very interesting. And you don't necessarily always come up with that on your own, but tools can help you come up with it more often. You know how we would do it? We'd uh, have basically eight AIs talk to each other, <sighs> working as these different brains, right? So one might <laughs> be responsible for one part, you know, one might be more emotionally intertuned, one might be more critical, one might be the, the creative that just throws things out there, mm. and one might be the more traditional and conservative, you know, that goes like, uh, but as that's been said before, you know, like, uh, if... Uh, we can have multiple AI talk to each other. So that might solve a lot of the early issues with the AI that we have today, which is, you know, like uh, it just puts a lot of content out there, but it doesn't know whether it's true or false. Do, I don't know if we talked about this the last conversations, <clears throat> but did we talk about the uh, video game AI experiment they did recently? Which one? So it was one of the bigger ones that came out where they had this little town and they had around like what, 15, 12 people in the town mm -hmm. and each person was an AI and they basically gave everybody personalities and just let them loose, kind of like a Westworld kind of thing and just mm -hmm. to see what they would do. And one of them had a Valentine's party they wanted to, ho to host. And so they sent out invitations to everybody, asked them all to do stuff like, hey, bring this, hey, bring that, and just interacted naturally with everybody and just there was a multiple brains that like you're talking about there. And it's just interesting how it just, yeah, fell out, fell together. Yeah. 
No, exactly. That's, I think, what we're going to have to move towards because also, you know, cramming everything into one AI might be very resource intensive and very inefficient. And it also creates a problem of generalization, which is, you know, if you start looking at these tools like uh, Dolly, Midjourney, and ChatGDP, their answers become very standardized to the point of almost being a bit boring because you're starting mm -hmm. to realize every single time you search for or try to create an art piece of a woman, it's going to be the same woman basically like it's gonna look more or less the same have the same features the same like straight face that it's like zoomed up a billion times right so now it, it becomes so easy to recognize so personalizing uh, ai and like allowing it to specialize and switch between different roles and mm -hmm. interact with other roles like might be necessary because it's we can't think every thought at the same time and we probably shouldn't think every thought at the same time i don't know if you realized it but i feel like you also went into the whole general source of specialist topic there as well by accident <laughs> in a way because i have been noticing there are these micro SaaS companies coming out where they're more specialized ai they're training the lmm models to be more focused for a certain task like you know excel sheets or making slideshows and stuff like that and specific types of images and this kind of gets a concept we need specialists too as someone who is a generalist and think we need way we need to highlight the generalist way more I do understand that we do need specialists still at the same time. We need a balance of both, whether it's 50-50 or 80-20, that's, that's a different conversation. But same thing with AIs, we need more general side eyes, we need more specialist AIs. Right. Yeah, I see what you mean. But at the same time, you know, a generalist can be a specialist, you know, it's more about the switching between roles, right? So uh, typically like uh, a person that is really good at a certain task, can do that really well. Like I have my programming, which I put my hours into, you know, which I do. And I have my psychology that I do and I have my influencing work that I do on YouTube. So like mm -hmm. uh, we can be specialized in uh, multiple domains as long as we're able to focus, right? So being able to focus your resources on one task for a longer amount of time is very important, right? So <laughs> if the problem is when people become too scattered, they're jumping between different topics and they can't focus on one for a longer amount of time because that means you lose depth, right? So it's, I would say like what I, what the answer that I've kind of landed on is learning to have fluidity, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, moving between sp different disciplines and up changing perspectives. Yeah. Fluidity. So what do you think is the connection of personality types and being multidisciplinary? That's a good question. Um, Take your time. I'd say that there are certain personality types that might go more towards, uh, trying out multiple things at the same time, you know, mm -hmm. like the extroverted intuitive types like uh, ENTPs and ENFPs seem to start out by doing a little bit of everything. And eventually, you know, the longer they go into things, the more specialized they become because mm -hmm. you, in the beginning, you're kind of just throwing things around there and, you know, you don't know where it's going, but further in, you start developing some specialties and finding certain things that you start like keening in on and focusing on more. Uh, but then you have like the introverted sensing types, like the ISTJs and ISFJs for contrast. And in a sense, like they might start out as specialists that, you know, get really interested about in a certain set of things, but <laughs> as they start going really deep into those topics, like over time, they will start to, you know, learn how to cross that line. They'll start realizing that, you know, this time I spent here understanding, for example, uh, sports or soccer or like uh, different things about exercise, these things I can apply when I raise my kids or like in decorating my house or like in different aspects yeah. of my life to the point where, you know, we start out in different, like I see it as a tree evolving, right? So we start out mm. in a certain area and everyone starts out in a different place through our genetics and our makeup. And then we evolve and as we evolve, we become more and more complicated in the sense that we start like broadening out. You brought up the tree concept and I actually have a question here. It's like, what is a tree of knowledge? Would you say a tree of knowledge? Uh, yeah. I remember we had some small conversations about it. So... Answer however you like, don't, don't use my answers from our previous conversation. Whatever you think is what I'm trying to get at. I'm just curious about what your thoughts are. I'd say that, you know, okay. So to know things like I had this conversation with a friend of mine about knowledge and truth, especially, right? Because he told me that, you know, there are a lot of things that I know are true, but I can't believe it. Right. So I can't like accept it. And it's very harsh and very difficult for me to understand this. So in a way, like I started, uh, 
I had those issues as well when I was younger, where I could be very perfectionistic about things, you know, thinking, you know, uh, it's either true or false and I'm either doing mm -hmm. good or I'm sucking at something and I'm not good enough. And I, right. So I, I'd have this idea that I used to think I was like a, a stone, a rough stone. I had to cut to a diamond, right. So mm. to make perfect somehow, but later on, I started thinking of myself instead of as, uh, as a tree that you had to kind of water and nourish. And, uh, what I started realizing was that, uh, by doing this, like, uh, I was working around myself and I was like building a strong foundation and I was starting to like root myself down and build normal, healthy attachments to things. And I was also at the same time through doing that and creating that space for myself, I was able to grow out and expand to other areas. And it was a lot less scary for me, right. To learn new things, to take on new skills, to uh, branch out and do new things because a lot of time when you start doing new things, you know, you suck at them, right? In the beginning, like it's yeah. new and you have no idea what you're doing and you're stumbling around like a kid in a store and you set everything on fire. <laughs> like, uh, but if you have like that strong root uh, and uh, certain things that you're very grounded in and things that you mm. feel very in touch with, like that you can always go back to if things get too much, you have that comfort zone, but you can also go outside that comfort zone because like sometimes having that root system, like it seems like it allows you to, uh, be more bold and take more risks and uh, try new things because you know, like having that security net and that safety net, like it means that you can jump higher. Well, and it's almost about like challenging your scripts in the way that you're saying there that we talked about earlier, these different scripts. And when you, t when it comes to that tree analogy, something that you said made me think about what I call phases. So I, I focus each focus I have, whether it's like education or swimming or whatever kind of niche is a phase of mine, but we were also talking about systems earlier. So I almost thought like the roots of the tree are the systems that you've built up. So they kind of build up all your habits, which make up your main trunk. And in your phases are your focuses that you're trying new things you're trying to do, or the stuff that you're focusing on during that time period. And they build up your habits too. So the tree yeah. itself is your habits. The roots are your systems and the, the the branches are your new phases that you're trying to reach out towards. And so it's kind of this holistic system. Right. That just makes me think about, because I was recently walking around in a forest and, you know, these trees that had grown very high and mm -hmm. it's very rare to see trees that have grown high in the Netherlands. Like most trees are like mm -hmm. 10 years old or 20 years old. So they don't really get that high, but this, these trees, they were really old. And uh, so you went there and you saw that it had all these branches like with no leaves right so under it like it had all these branches old branches that they're basically useless now right so they all like all the leaves are gone they, they don't serve any purpose because there's no sunlight the sunlight can't reach down there so it just keeps going higher and higher and higher um so in a way like there's a lot of like uh, you know, when we think about truth, you know, the question is like, how do we get there? Like, how do we achieve truth? And how do I, how do we achieve knowledge about things in general? And I started realizing that, you know, we kind of have to start out wrong and then mm -hmm. slightly correct, and slightly more correct, and slightly more correct, you know, and uh, all those yeah. like all, all those old ideas and old beliefs, they're not stupid. They're not bad. They're not a waste of time. They were how you got to where you are today. Right. So they, are what brought you to knowledge. So you kind of have to stumble around and like grow. And like, there's a lot of things that you did and memories that you gathered over your life to know that, you know, uh, you'd, you'd handle those situations completely differently today than how you did them, but, uh, they still got you where you are today. So like, if you can have that perspective, it's a lot mm -hmm. easier to understand other people and yourself too, a lot less judgment. And given the whole tree analogy and knowledge areas, it kind of leads me to my next question here too. What is the forest for thought channel that you've made? Yeah. So I've started building a lot of new YouTube channels and mm -hmm. I've been having a lot of success with that. I started one for INFPs. I started some for ENFPs and ENTPs and I'm starting one for INFJs, and INTJs. So I'm like starting to branch out into different topics and uh, different areas. But Forest for Thought is the one I'm probably the most excited about and the most engaged with. Like the conversations that I start there uh, so far have been so revelatory for me. So. Mm -hmm. 
for me, like nature and the uh, trees and forests and like these kind of metaphors have always been very impactful. Like I have my history in the Green Party. Like I've always been um, very passionate about nature and uh, felt a strong connection to uh, plants and birds and insects and you know all things that are you know like when I'm in a forest, I'm like one of my ha at my happiest, right? So. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when I talk, when I talk about on forest for thought is uh, expanding your consciousness. I talk about uh, becoming, uh, growing your intelligence, like uh, learning new skills. I talk about uh, neurodivergence and the different ways of giftedness, different ways of thinking. I talk about giftedness and uh, you know the struggles that can come around intelligence, but also like how you can nurture it and how you can use it to your advantage, and how everyone can learn to uh, become more conscious in everything that they do and in mm -hmm. all things life. Right. So those are the kind of videos that I've started making there. That's awesome, and I love how you have all these different channels. We were talking about it uh, when we had our own conversations about like managing all that and whether or not you should do one channel for all personality types or doing multiple channels for each type. And I really think in your case, like it's starting to grow on me more so the way you explain it, the way your thought processes are. Because for me, I didn't want to do a channel for my swimming content. I'm just going to put that on my main one. But when it came to gaming, I had to separate it. But for you, with all these different personality types, having those niche channels for each type, I think is going to be really cool, especially since I think that you in particular are able to manage all that. I think a lot of people wouldn't be able to handle that many channels. How do you manage it all? Your blog, your channels, all that jazz. Yeah, I think um, it's funny because uh, like I spend a lot less time working than ever. Like I, I tend to be less active. Like I, you know, the older I get, the more I start slowing down and doing things more carefully and like calmly. And um, so like. Uh, I've slowly gone towards, you know, spending more and more time outdoors, just reading, you know, uh, kind of like just relaxing. And I found that, you know, the more I re started relaxing, the more productive I was able to be and the more mm. energy I got in my productive time. So I started realizing that less was more here in a sense. And um, I got so much inspiration from doing that too, because the more time I spent just relaxing, the more ideas I started having, because, you know, you can think of it, like if you think about consciousness versus unconsciousness, like a lot of the time, you know, uh, expanding your consciousness is great, but actually learning to use your unconscious to your advantage is equally mm -hmm. powerful because your unconscious, it seems like it can do everything your conscious can do, but a hundred times faster and backwards and forwards and upside down at the same time. Right. So <laughs> it seems like you're in your unconscious, you know, when you, for example, take 20 minutes to read or study something, and then you take 40 minutes to, you know, just, uh, meditate, you know, afterwards, you know, that's huge for your brain. Like that's such an opportunity because that's when your brain starts building all these new pathways and learning and uh, <laughs> revising and, you know, being able to do these things, like it seems like we're able to do more and more. So my recipe seems to be just about that. Just uh, spend more time, uh, you know, just relaxing and uh, being more in tune with myself. And through that, like I have endless inspiration. Like I talk about mm -hmm. like the infinity uh, source or the infinity well. It's like... Uh, uh, some concept that I got from an Ayn Rand book, yeah, actually. Uh, but uh, regardless of what you think about her politically, like her philosophical thoughts on that, like I thought that was, in a sense, it was a really apt metaphor because it's like mm. we have everyone inside of us. We have we have this infinity source, like we have this like infinite source of energy and enthusiasm and passion and creativity if we can find it, right? So we have to you know connect with yourselves to find it and to connect with it and. Uh, like the practice of studying the Tao and Taoism, mm -hmm. like that's, that's basically about that. Right. So like when they talk about like, how do you achieve flow? How do you achieve like Sam? Like, and what can you do with Sam? Right. Because if you look at, at most people that have like been able to tap into that and I can say, I still have my work cut out for me. I'm still thinking about it and working to balance myself. Right. If you look at, you know, the, uh, people that have been able to maintain that state permanently, like, uh, that have basically become almost enlightened, right? Uh, what you can see is they're extremely productive people. They're doing so much. They're, you know, able to read so much, learn so much, meet so many people, create so much because, you know, they are in that space and they are less anxious yeah. because of it. 
you brought up the Tao, I was going to bring up the Tao myself, and Atman, and Hinduism as well, and just that primordial spirit that some of the Western thought leaders would think about too. It's just interesting how there's a lot of connections between all the mythologies, philosophies, and religions around the world. One thing I was also thinking about too, one thing I was also thinking about too, is the idea of just how you balance out system one and system two of our minds. Yes. After these after these interviews, I often go for a walk in nature to try to consume all the stuff that we just talked about and try to just like, like yeah. Try to just like yeah, maybe that's what we should do. Whoever's listening today should go out and go for a walk while listening to this or after listening to this. They probably they are maybe they already are. are. <laughs> I do podcast walks too. What is one thing that you wish you knew sooner? Mm, good one. Well, thank you. <laughs> I I would say that uh, I uh, wish I knew sooner that uh, you know you have to stand up for yourself. <laughs> kind mm. of. like you actually there are times in your life where you kind of have to fight. Like and you have to know like when to fight and when to uh, you know turn out a sheik, right? So a lot mm. of the time, like I've often had this like strategy where it's like, you know, I thought if I do the right thing and I, if I'm kind towards others, everything will work out. Right. But these days, like, it's more easy for me, you know, in a sense to speak out for my rights and to stand up for myself, like, uh, and for what I need. And, uh, also like I'm more well versed in law and legal rights and things like that as well. So when it comes to, you know, managing work and, uh, uh legal issues, which I've sadly had to deal with, like in the past few years, like I, uh, realized that, okay, I have to know my laws and I have to know my rights so that I can manage with my landlord, with my boss and, mm. you know, make sure that, you know, I, I get what I deserve and what I, what is my right. And also to, right. yeah, push for that. So like, uh, in the beginning, I was very hesitant to do that because I was like, I'm sure they'll come around and they'll figure it out and they'll, you know, uh, help me out. But then I realized, okay, that's not going to happen, right? Like they're going to try to get as much as they can out of the situation. So, um, I learned to, to develop scripts of being a bit more aggressive, uh, when yeah. necessary. Or sort of in a way too. It's one of those things where you have to be able to defend yourself. The, when I've seen different posts about like how to be a man, right? It's not about like, oh, I'm going to be an alpha, whatever. No, the complete man, the, the modern man is someone who can be a gentleman, charismatic and, you know, have that soft side. But it's also mm -hmm. when push comes to shove, you can push back. You have that ability to fight back if need to. You just hold yeah. back on doing that as much as possible because violence is not usually the answer. But sometimes you have to defend yourself or more importantly, defend others as well. Exactly. Like the truth is like, I think that, uh, when we look at a lot of like the, uh, polymaths, like Da Vinci and Einstein and a lot of these, uh, people, what is interesting about them is they are all, they were all pacifists and, uh, mm -hmm. they were often vegetarians. And so what I'm starting to see is like, it seems that, you know, the more we develop our intelligence and the more intelligent we become, the more conscious we become, like, it seems like the more we are inclined to be peaceful and amicable, like, because we also, I think, because I think we use violence when we don't know any other option, right? So mm -hmm. the main reason people engage in violence today is because they're pushed into a corner, they, their mind can't process the situation and what's happening. And they lash out because they don't know how to manage the situation differently. Like they can't think in that situation. And so if you're like able to think more about it, it becomes a lot easier to think of other strategies. But even then, like, yeah, like people have still have to know and understand that, you know, you're a person that will speak up for yourself if necessary. Like, uh, okay, I will try to speak in a calm tone and I will try to make sure that we can have a friendly conversation. But if you speak over me over and over again and don't let me speak, I'm going to have to, you know, uh, speak up for myself, right? So like <laughs> just realizing that, like, and finding also friendly and peaceful ways to fight with people because a lot of the time, you know, it's good to be able to stand up for yourself. But I tend to think you have to learn to fight with one hand open. So mm -hmm. also when you are fighting, you have to show people that, you know, I have an olive branch stretched out here. Like if you can, if you want to take it, it's still here. If you're ready to, you know, otherwise I will yeah. have to fight, <laughs> you know? Well, and it's all, sometimes you have to fight with the mind rather than your fists. And yeah. it is interesting to think about Abraham Lincoln is one of the presidents here that he's pretty famous. And he has a quote where it's, I destroy my enemies by making them my friends. 
And I love that quote. I remember at one point during karaoke, there was this guy who we both sang the same song for our first song. We popped our karaoke, as they say, to that same song. And so we had this kind of almost competitive mindset. Like, no, it's my song. No, it's my song. Obviously, it's karaoke. It's neither one of our songs. But we both had that attachment to it. And it started to get to this point of not aggression, but like, hey, you know, uh, testosterone, if you will. And something clicked in me. And I was like, you know what? Screw that. Like, we shouldn't be competing for it. We're both awesome for choosing that song. It was a Queen song too, mind you. So it wasn't an easy one to do, especially for our first one. We're we're awesome for choosing that. We should become friends, not enemies. And he agreed, and we, yeah, that's what happened. But it's just interesting Which how that's was it. Fat Bottom Girls by Queen. <laughs> good one, good one. Yes. So we're both quite young. We still have plenty of time in our life, hopefully, right? And the thing is, there's a lot of things we are going to be able to do. We have a lot of content, obviously, we both are planning to do. And I am interested to see where you're going to go. What is your end goal or like a magnum opus of sorts? Yeah, I've had one goal since I was a kid that I've continuous, mm. continued to work towards. And uh, only yesterday did I realize that it's actually theoretically possible to achieve. Mm. <laughs> so uh, my, my end magnum opus, my main goal has always been to learn everything about everything right so like to uh come to a point where you uh, basically have a full understanding of like all the secrets of the universe like in a sense you feel like connection to everything like that's what i've been working to my entire life i'd say and so that's why i've chosen to work multidisciplinary that's why i've like worked through multiple fields because wanting to reach that rounded knowledge not just a theoretical expertise, but also a practical mm -hmm. experience of something, right? So just a full, uh, like some people call it gnosis or like enlightenment, right? Basically. So, but I've never thought of it was possible, right? Because I thought, you know, the brain has a limit to how much it can hold and what they can think of and what they can learn. And so, but um, the more I started studying quantum mechanics and alchemy and other subjects, the more I started realizing that hey, it's, th there might be ways to do this. Like there is, mm -hmm. I can see theoretical ways through which I could achieve that experience, right? So, and that's been like a really exciting thought for me, like lately, just realizing that, hey, it's, it's actually possible to you know, experience that. Well, and that's one like I love about like immortality too, for example, because then you have the time to do all that. And the fact that you're pretty mo pretty excited about it makes me more excited because you know you get that kind of mentality of oh no, there's not enough time in life to learn everything. And people confuse the concept of like the Renaissance person with polymath. While they're very similar, the Renaissance person was the person who knew everything. The polymath is just a multi expert, if you will. But polymaths still try to learn everything. And that's why I came up with the concept of Omnimath. I didn't fully come up with it. I think there's other people who did too. I only saw two other places on the internet, at least at that time, that actually even mentioned the word polymath, uh, Omnimath, I mean. Hmm. And I linked to those resources as well, like a tweet and some blog post. But the concept itself is theoretical. It's, it's not, quote unquote, possible in conventional means. But again, alchemy, quantum physics, you know, neuroscience, we don't know the true limits per se. And we can also try to strive towards that goal. And who knows, maybe we'll become the first ones. Maybe you'll become the first one when it comes to that. Yeah, or we'll at least plant the branch, which makes it possible for other people to get there, yeah. right? Because of course, like a lot of the time, you know, these things take a lot more time than what we uh, like uh, imagine, but it's still such a fascinating project. And it's uh, one <laughs> that I am con happy to continue on for the rest of my life. Like it's something that I have so much fun studying and learning yeah. about, like, uh, and every little thing I figure out, like it's uh, just an explosion of inspiration and enthusiasm and like, uh, uh, yeah, it, uh, I, I can really tell the positive impacts it's had on my life and uh, how it's helped me and uh, my relationships and in what I do. And so I'm very grateful already for the steps that I've already made. Well, diversification and adjacent knowledge are definitely super helpful and we'll sure as hell try. I know that for sure. Where can people find you online and see your journey? everywhere <laughs> <laughs> yes love that yeah you can find me on my youtube channel eric thor where it's just my main channel and you can find me of course on forest for thought especially if you're interested in polymathy and uh, in uh, uh, consciousness and uh, giftedness and such topics 
or mm -hmm. you could uh, visit my website, Personalitopia, if you want to take my personality tests. I have multiple personal tests that you can try there. Uh, and uh, it's a fun way to just explore yourself and how you think about different things. And uh, yeah, uh, you can always just message me on Eric Thor as well. So like, it's, I'm very easy to reach. Well, and you just released a video about polymathy and different personality types. I have that linked in the description as well. And I always have a challenge, like when I go on podcast shows and people ask where they can find me, I always leave this little challenge, like I, I dare you to find a platform that I'm not on. And you're like the first person I could probably say is probably the same way in that regard too. Yeah, actually, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. I actually started posting on LinkedIn uh, like uh, yesterday <laughs> for Good. the first time. So now you can say like uh, I've started to cover those areas too. And it's uh, content repurposing and it's like learning mm -hmm. to be creative and how I post and how I do and like... Uh, having, you know, days which I dedicate to, you know, creating things in Canva, like different social mm -hmm. media posters or like having like times, you know, when you're uh, blogging exclusively and just writing a ton of things that you schedule up over time. Right. So that's, that yeah. makes it easier. <laughs> Love repurposing is a whole niche of my own there. I feel that once again, this is Dustin Miller, Poly Innovator and Eric Thor of the Polymath Polycast. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much.